You're listening to the Deerfield Public Library podcast, February 28th, 2023. The real reason I did this was because I needed time to express myself. This month on the Deerfield Public Library podcast, we're beginning our 2023 season presenting a conversation with pianist Seymour Bernstein. You may know him as the subject of the widely acclaimed hit 2015 documentary, Seymour, An Introduction, directed by Ethan Hawke. The film tells Seymour's inspiring story of abandoning his solo concert career at age 50 and, at the end of the documentary, performing again in his 80s. Yet, as we discuss in this interview, there are other ways to tell the story and a lot more beyond an introduction to Seymour Bernstein. Now in his mid-90s, he turns 96 this April, Seymour is recording, putting out popular YouTube videos, and like in this conversation, sharing with us deep reflections on following your intuition in musical interpretation, yes, with Beethoven, Chopin, and Schubert, and also in life. My name is Dylan Zavagno. I'm the Adult Services Coordinator here at the Deerfield Public Library, and I'm honored to share this conversation with Seymour Bernstein. So I have so many things to ask you, but I thought I'd just start by asking, how are you today? Are, are you in Maine? I'm in Maine, and if you could see what's to my right, you see I'm on a bluff, 60-foot bluff, above the Atlantic Ocean. I, every, I'm, I look at a scene of unimaginable beauty every morning. That's wonderful. So I wanted to start by telling you about an intuition that I had about you. Yes. And I should <laughs> I should let our listeners know that I've met you several times before. My fiance, the pianist Daniel Bear, is one of your devoted students. And my introduction to you was appropriately the documentary that Ethan Hawke made, Seymour, an introduction. Now that came out almost a decade ago. And since then, I've met you several times in your lovely studio apartment in New York, and I've seen you teach, and I've heard many stories about you. So the last several weeks, I have read your books. Which books did you read? So, Seymour, I read with your own two hands. I read Oh, Monsters. that's the major one. That's the major one. Whoa, I read Monsters read, and Angels. Monsters and Angels, wow. So I have to tell you, I have read all of these books and I watched the movie again and now having known you a bit and read the books I said you know this documentary is exactly what people say it is it's inspiring it people walk away from it and say I have to start writing again I have to start painting because they're so inspired by your story but I had this intuition that the documentary is framed as you're leaving the solo concert stage and then returning. And when I read through your books and have thought about you more, I said, this was not as sad a story as it's made to seem sometimes, that you are actually very intentionally choosing to follow a creative impulse that the world would have been deprived of if you hadn't. And I was so amazed, for example, that that solo recital, your final solo recital, where you didn't tell anyone it was going to be your last recital. I didn't even tell my mother. Not even your mother. You played Beethoven, but then you played this wild composition of your own American Pictures at an exhibition, which included you soft shoeing in a straw hat, singing projections of wild Americana pictures, contemporary paintings, Larry Rivers, Jared French. I was shocked. There's this fun wildness and exuberance in your creative impulse, your, com- your composing and your writing that I thought, Maybe that sometimes gets left out of the Seymour Bernstein story. What do you think?
that completely gets left out. And you're the only one that I have ever spoken to. Never mind interviews or lessons or, or meeting musicians. Nobody has ever come to that conclusion. And what, you nailed it so perfectly that I'm overwhelmed. I can hardly speak. I'm so overwhelmed. But I never have any trouble speaking, so I'm going to continue to speak. <laughs> Please. <laughs> well, the reason why I, I took, I, I took a, a sabbatical, not a sabbatical, the reason why I drew my professional career as a performer to an end was for the very reason you stated. I had a creative urge in me that was being suffocated by all the hours of sitting at the piano practicing to prepare for recitals. And teaching, I had to support myself through teaching. So I had no time to be creative, to write. I, By the way, you know, I was a photographer also. Did you know yes. that? Yes. Yes, there's stunning photographs in Monsters and Angels, yeah. So I wasn't calling my per performing career to an end until I was able to cross the stage with wild nervousness, as most performers have, <laughs> and play well in spite of my nervousness. Get it? Yes. I would. I never thought I was going to get rid of the nervousness. I don't think anyone does. I mean, if they're sensitive and and they're disciplined, it's not a normal thing to walk across the stage and give a solo recital. <laughs> One has a reason to be nervous, yes? Yeah. So I reached that point. And on my last solo recital, I was terribly nervous, but boy, did I play well. <laughs> By the way, you know, I'm going to be 96 in April. Yes. So when, I, when I reached my 90s, I began to see how important it is to be truthful. So I'm telling you the truth. I play gorgeously. <laughs> it's true. I don't care if it sounds like an ego statement. It was true. And so I was happy to say farewell to the stage. You know, it really wasn't a complete farewell because... I went on playing chamber music. Right. But what I did was I had lots of time to write and to contemplate life and so forth. And I've been happy ever since. Well, it's so because, you know, Ethan Hawke connected with you because of his own stage fright. So it makes sense that the documentary would be framed through that lens. But I just have had such immense pleasure listening to your compositions and reading your writing. And I want to read a quote from With Your Own Two Hands because I think many people have given the same type of advice over the years of, oh, you have to follow your creative impulse. But the way that you wrote it, I hadn't heard this in this way before. So let, let me read this to you. You're describing um, the importance of practicing and with a pupil. And the pupil says, well, all that is fine for a genius, but where do I fit in to the picture? You fit in whatever place you make for yourself, I said. If you value your gifts, and I mean really value them, you will act like a genius even if you cannot be one. And that means paying serious attention to what you are. Instead of complaining about what you are not or succumbing to the view that you need not practice conscientiously or study with a master teacher unless you are headed for a major career, 
look upon your talent as something uniquely yours and develop it. After all, measuring your gifts against another's is really as futile as comparing the various manifestations of beauty in the myriad forms of nature. Now, to, for someone to say, your talent is yours. It's your responsibility to develop it. And then for you to follow that yourself, that seems like the real message of what you were doing with leaving the stage. I think so. You're so perceptive, Dylan. I'm <laughs> so amazed at you. The, the interview has only begun, and I'm in awe of you for what you're telling, what you have already concluded. You nailed it straight on the head. It's amazing. You summed, the, summed me up better than anyone that I've met so far. Ethan Hawke. I think the reason he was drawn to me is because he himself is creative. He's written books. He's not only just an actor. We had a question and answer period after our documentary. You know, it opened at Lincoln Center. Oh, wow. I walked the red carpet <laughs> <laughs> before. I said, Ethan, how do you, what should I do? He said, just follow me. <laughs> and so question and answer period at the end of the documentary. And we were sitting on the stage. It was a huge success. I can't tell you what a success that documentary has been. It's huge, yes. You know about Rotten Tomatoes? Yes, and I think you have a 100% rating. <laughs> That's right, 100% rave reviews. All right, so... The head of the film department asked Ethan, why did you make this documentary on Seymour? And this is what Ethan said. Before I met Seymour and read his books, I thought that life influences the way I act. But now I know the way I act influences my life. Mm. that's what changed him like night and day it was like a switch said what am I doing it's through my art that I can develop not only through life but through my art and that's it I think the essence of who we are is found in our talent whatever that talent is. I, I wanted to ask you too, one of the things that I found very moving reading your books is how you describe that very idea that your art is what influences your life, that that idea took you a while to come to in your own life. And I think it in, did. One, in one passage you describe maybe around 15, you realized if you practiced well, then the rest of your social life went well. And then maybe at 30, you started to kind of put that more into words and teach people that. But it wasn't till 50 that you could write it out in a book. And you you have this focus on self-realization. And I wondered if you could say more what self-realization means to you, because I think the definition from an analyst might be uh, the time when you can put a narrative on your life. I think that it can't even be measured. It happens gradually, unconsciously. See? Mm. And at what time does it, come into reality so that you can actually write something down about it. That time is different with every person. Mm. It could happen at 50. It could happen at 90. I want to tell you something. I have certain realizations 
that occurred to me only when I turned 90. Certain realizations of concerning playing the piano, mind you, in a technical way. Can you picture <laughs> that at 90, I started to play better than I did when I was 89? It was very strange. I can't, I, I'm still amazed at it, even while I'm speaking to you today. So at this very moment, my friend Bill Finizio is making what I, I hate to tell you this, Dylan. <laughs> it's probably my last video. I mean, mm -hmm. I am 96. How, many, how, many, how much farther can I go? So it's probably my last video. And what is it called? Reaching 90. Mm. And it's a combination of all the pieces I recorded from the age of 90 on. Wow. And the reason why I'm making this video is because it's a message to the world. Don't think that when you get older, you're going to be chained to a wheelchair watching television all day. My real life, the life that I always envisioned, began at 90. That's how I look at it now. That's my realization. My real life began at 90. The, 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 the rest of the time was a preliminary for it. As I told you, with each person, it comes at a different age. Shall I give you an example? Please. Well, when Schubert was 30, he had written 10 symphonies. How many do you think Beethoven wrote at 30? I don't know. One. Now, he was studying with Haydn at the time. What would have happened in the world if Haydn said to Beethoven, you should be ashamed of yourself at 30? You've written one symphony, Schubert's written 10. I'm not sure that you should proceed as a career, in, as, as a composer, as a, as a career. I'm not sure that you should. What would have happened if Beethoven took that seriously? No Beethoven, no Ninth Symphony, no Mrs. Solemnus, no 32 Beethoven sonatas, huh? So everything is, every realization comes at a different age. This is amazing. Um, I have to read a quote from you again. Uh, this was a YouTube video you posted in 2020 of the Moonlight Sonata. And you wrote, in the first movement of the so-called Moonlight Sonata, Beethoven seems to have captured the sadness of the world through musical notation. I don't know of any other composition comparable to this one. Throughout my performing life, I have tried to capture my concept of this profound work. Now, at the age of 93, I am happy to say that I have come closer. I did. I performed it, see? For the first time, I reached a realization of what I think of the moon, that the moonlight sonata should sound like. Nobody else does it the way I do. And I, and I did it and I put it on YouTube. And now over the next few weeks, the organization Tone Base, you know that organization? Yes. And I'm going to give a lesson, a video, on the first movement of the Moonlight Sonata, everyone will have to erase everything they said. <laughs> I hate to tell you that. First of all, I have no patience for so-called professional musicians mm. who don't really get to the core of teaching something. 
you know, I'm not mentioning names, but the, the virtuosity is staggering in our profession. I hear, I hear phenomenal pianists on YouTube giving a lesson on a Chopin etude and playing it in the most dazzling fashion. And you're never going to find out how they do it because they won't tell you. They'll tell <laughs> you everything else. The story, what was going on in Chopin's life at the time he wrote that. Look how it goes from C major to F major by the 10th bar or something like this. But they're never going to tell you how they get from one note to the next. <laughs> when I start to talk about the Moonlight Sonata, I have to tell the audience, I have to try not to cry. Because when I play that first C-sharp minor broken chord, my heart breaks open. Yeah. I can hardly get past that first chord. It's so moving to me. So that's, that's how I'm going to begin, just to tell them what it means to me. How to get that sound out of the piano. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> well, it's amazing on YouTube. So Tonebase is a music education service, but they have many free videos on YouTube. Your video of the Chopin E minor prelude if you just search, oh, you saw that. oh, of course. Did you see that? Seymour, it is what one of the most it? popular videos on Chopin E minor Prelude. If you search Chopin E minor Prelude in YouTube, it's right on the front page. You have half a million views. It's unbelievable. And is, is it a half a million? Is it really? It is. You're doing exactly what you're talking about, which I find so amazing. You're connecting that emotional content to pieces that we've heard millions of times. You know, these are things like Van Gogh sunflowers or something. And you have a Fur Elise yes. video too, where I yes. said, I've heard Fur Elise thousands of times in my life, but it only moved me when I heard you play it. So how do you account for that? Is it, is it technical things that you've developed over the years, taking different time or wrist placement or, you know, I don't know all the technical stuff, or is it developing your inner soul or is it a combination? I'm going to tell you the truth. You know, when I wrote, when I wrote with your own two hands, mm -hmm. I interviewed as many famous performers as I could find. I wanted to find out what their education was, how they view their career, how they deal with their nervousness. I found out one startling thing. Almost every one of them told me they're self-taught. Wow. And I want you to know that they studied with the greatest musical figures in the world, like I did. I studied with, I was Brylovsky's only pupil. Right. You know, Brylovsky was the first pianist to play all this open works in public. I was his only pupil at 19. Then Clifford Curzon adopted me. He brought me to London and taught me for six months. And I knew him for 20 years, you know. We were inseparable when he came to New York every two years. All right, in, in the end, here is the end. I fooled all of them. What do you mean? <laughs> I'm about to tell you. I heard Clifford Curzon actually say, all right, you, oh, your technique is already finished. I don't have to worry about that. What I thought? Oh my God, I fooled him too. I had terrible problems technically. I worked so hard 
sometimes eight hours a day practicing so that I learned to play so well to cover up all of my unpleasant feelings at the keyboard. Mm. I fooled them all. That's because I was so musical. My musical talent overrode everything. And so I learned physically how to manage all the difficult passages. But I didn't even know how I did it. I just experimented, right? Every passage was something new, brand new. So the key to being self-taught, that is, whatever I feel, I have to make a physical connection to it. How do I make a physical connection to playing softly? How do I make a physical connection to playing legato on the piano? What do I do with my body? That's the whole secret. Mm. Now, some people do it naturally, you know. They're genetically programmed. Well, I'm so interested in what you're saying now because you write you know, beautifully about the connections in your teaching lineage that go all the way back to Beethoven, from Clara Husserl to Lechetisky to Czerny to Beethoven. Yes. yes. Well, I tell all my pupils they're connected to Beethoven. But that's not genetic oh, well, then. No, no, that's no. Of course not. <laughs> that's only something charming. Ah. Well, Beethoven's pupil was Czerny. Czerny taught Lechetitsky. Lechetitsky taught a pianist by the name of Brylovsky and all the great pianists of the century. And Brylovsky taught me, and now I'm teaching you. <laughs> so you're seven times removed from Beethoven. And you know what we're talking about now? There's some, something superficial about this, correct? Yes, yes. You would think that that's going to influence their, their, the way they play. Well, but it doesn't. So this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. The great artists, the great artists today speak like that superficially. They don't get right down to the core of how you do things. And, and I get angry with them because they're the ones who know how to play best. And they don't tell you. I don't think that they know themselves. Let me ask you, love to ask you about this story that is an instance of your intuition about a composer proving correct. And this is when you were playing Beethoven's Opus 111 for Sir Clifford Curzon. And you write very movingly that there was a moment after these long, complicated trills when there's a dynamic crescendo, Mark. And you said, I cannot yes. play this crescendo. Can you tell us that story? Because it, it speaks exactly to what you're talking about with the intuition um, that certain people have about music. Well, but that's that's one of the key issues musically in my life, that moment in Beethoven. <laughs> because that revealed something to me about my own gifts. It was that's that's why it was so startling to me. You know, that's the last sonata Beethoven ever wrote. Right. He felt that the sonata form for him came to an end. And that sonata has only two movements. So his pupil Schindler said to him, Master, are you going to write third movement? And for Beethoven, that was the saddest question ever asked him. 
because that meant that Schindler didn't understand that there was nothing else to say. Can you picture 32 sonatas coming to an end on a pianissimo C major chord? C major. The most That's basic, the key with yeah. no sharp surplus. The basic key. Yeah. It's like the, the embryo of music. Schindler didn't understand that. So Beethoven said, are you going to write a third movement? I don't have the time. So here is in the middle of the second movement, which is the end of the earth. What can I tell you? Thomas Mann, you know, wrote a novel in which he, the, uh, Professor Kretschmar is giving a lecture to his students. And he says, and here it comes. <laughs> the chains of thrills comes the longest thrills known to humans. Let me interrupt you briefly. I just want to tell everyone that's from Dr. Faustus and the translation. Oh, exactly, yes. The translation in English uses the phrase leave-taking. It was Beethoven's leave-taking of the sonata form. And I believe you use the phrase leave-taking in Monsters and Angels to talk about your leave-taking of the solo stage. But anyway, continue oh, with your... Dylan, you are so sharp. <laughs> I knew you I got that are... one right. <laughs> I think you're the most amazing person that ever <laughs> interviewed me. Thank you. Well, please go on with your story. I just had to, to share that. <laughs> well, here comes these chains of trills. What the practice entailed for me to manage those trills. Well, for every, for every pianist, because it starts with a single trill and then there's the trills in the right hand and the left hand together. Now two trills. And then a third trill is introduced. So one hand is playing two trills at the same time. <laughs> Please. It's almost impossible. You know, Beethoven didn't care. He just wrote music. <laughs> so now here's what's happening. The right hand is going higher and higher and higher and trilling all the time. The left hand is going lower and lower and lower into the bass. At one point, the right hand is so high and the left hand is so low that the hands are five and a half octaves apart. The first time I sight read that piece and Beethoven is pulling my hands apart like this. What is this, Dylan? Well, I know you, you write about it as being a crucifixion. I said, Beethoven is crucifixing me. And I burst into tears. And I said to myself, my God, a crescendo? Something's wrong. How can there be a crescendo to such a profound thing like this? I'm not going to do it. It's the only time that I refuse to follow Beethoven's marking. I simply refuse it. So I'm studying with Clifford Curzon. He's going to play it next year in New York. So he wanted to go through it with me. So I got to that place and he stops me and says, Laddie, what are you doing? There's, there's a crescendo there. Clifford, I can't do it. What do you mean you can't do it? You don't have to make a big crescendo. You can't do nothing. I said, I want to do nothing. I want to go to the diminuendo. You're too stubborn, Seymour. Let's go on with it. I see I'm not going to make any progress with you. So I came home to New York, and my late friend Sheila Aldendorf gave me the facsimile of the manuscript. Do you realize what that is? Yes. Beethoven's own writing. I turned the pages, and I came to that measure of crucifixion. And it's in my video. I photographed it. The word crescendo was erased in the manuscript. 
I called Clifford Kurz and he said, no, Seymour, really so? I said, yes, Clifford. Someone erased that crescendo. The shot company in Mainz, Germany, has published my book with your own two hands. Mm. They published Beethoven's sonatas. The shot company said, you understand that Beethoven had editors who made fair copies of the hieroglyphics that were the manuscript. Uh. They're called the fair copy. From the fair copy, they did the publication. So Beethoven had the word crescendo there, and the editors included the crescendo, that they had to be faithful. Since it was published, someone erased the crescendo. Now, who do you think erased the crescendo? So it must have been Beethoven? Do you ever think any you think <laughs> anyone would dare take Beethoven's manuscript and erase a word? Only Beethoven could have done that. He probably said, Oh my God, what have I done? And he erased it. So that's my intuition was working really forcefully at that time. Right. Yes. Well, I have another quote from you about intuition because it, it's almost a theme through our whole conversation about trusting that a realization in your life will come at the time that it comes for you and trusting these intuitions too. So in your book, Chopin Interpreting His Notational Symbols, you write- You read the, that book too? I did. Now, I, I don't understand all the- of all of the technical stuff, but I at least got this out of it, where at the end you said, I used to suffer guilt when my musical instincts told me one thing and my eye another. The only thing that helped to ameliorate this conflict was to search for confirmations of my intuitive responses, which is like what you just told us about that story with uh, Opus 111. Okay, continuing the quote, one doesn't always find them, however, and we are put to a severe test in making interpretive decisions. This creates yet another conflict, but one which has a positive end for the process of striking a balance between musical intuition and logical and imaginative thinking calls forth the composer in us. That's at the end of your book, Chopin interpreting his notational symbols. How wonderful. <laughs> hey, good for me. <laughs> Now, look, Dylan, yes. here's another one. Listen okay. to this one. I'm 15, and I'm studying with a woman in Newark, New Jersey, who studied with Lechitsky when she was 16. She loved Schubert as I did. Schubert is the only composer in the same piece he writes decrescendo, which means to get softer, and diminuendo, which means to get softer. <laughs> He's the only composer who uses two words to mean the same thing. Mm. That this just tell you how faulty music notation can be. When I would play for my teacher, Clara Husserl, uh -huh. and I would make a retard at a certain why are you making a retard? There's no retard there. I said, I feel there has to be a retard. Well, don't stop feeling that way. You have no right to make a retard when the composer didn't call for it. So I used to walk home to my parents and I'm thinking, She's getting old now. She just doesn't love music anymore. <laughs> Get it? I wasn't going to listen to her. So one day, the editor of the new Schubert edition was playing chamber music, and he came upon the word diminuendo. And five bars later, in the music, it said, 
a tempo. Oh, he let out a scream. Said, <laughs> I discovered the secret of life. Diminuendo means get softer and slower to make a retard. But decrescendo means only to get softer. So that was, went around the world, I can't tell you. <laughs> That was in the in the preface of the new edition of Schubert. He, all of this is written out. The secret is written out. Only 15 years ago. Picture this. So now my intuition was working when I was 15. I knew when to make the retard. It's just remarkable. I, you know, I don't even know where to go from there, but I do have just a list of several stories that I thought I could ask you about. The first one, which sort of relates to all of the technical issues affecting your whole life, when you talk about your time in the Korean War and your training with your M1 rifle, and the M1, you say, has this kickback on the thumb, and people would walk around with bandaged thumbs, and you thought, well, oh, this no. Is was called the M1 thumb. The M1 thumb. Out of commission, totally. It was the chamber in which you put the, the bullet itself. Ah. You had to open the chamber. It was on a spring, right? And there was a, a little line in here that closes. If you touch that line, the, the chamber closes in a flash with violence, you know, it could really, actually, it could decapitate your, your thumb. So I was scared to death. This is the end of my career. <laughs> well, what was so funny to me is that you say in your memoir that you were so scared, but then you realized that it was just the piano technique of rotating your wrist in supination. Oh, yes, that's right. That's right. Supination. That that right. saved you. So music saved you once again. <laughs> you know that this is supination and this is pronation. Yes, right. turning in, pronation, turning out, right. supination. The other thing from the war years that I was stunned to learn is that you were on um, Kate Smith's television show and people probably... Oh. Dear, oh dear. <laughs> People probably don't know who Kate Smith was, but she popularized the song God Bless America. She was a. No, listen, he wrote it for her. Yes, right, right. Irving Berlin. Um, Irving Berlin wrote it for her, right? And she had this program during the Korean War, and I could not get over. So you played on the program several times, but she kept you in mind. So she would say for months after, oh, let's all pray for our boys. That's Korea. right. That's and right. that I, special pianist, Seymour Bernstein. So millions of people must have had some image of you in mind when they thought of the Korean War back at home. It's true. Yes. You know, I was on the I was the first soldier on her program. Her manager, Ted Collins, and the NBC staff went on a tour of the entire United States. They went to one army camp after another. So Kenneth Gordon, the violinist, and I were the first, we were the first two chosen for the program, exposing gifted soldiers who were in inducted into the army and listen to how they play. They were going to go to Korea. I had never been on television before. I was backstage wondering, when am I going to get my heart attack? <laughs> In the middle of the piece or before? <laughs> Whereupon Kate Smith comes down the steps and it's an unbelievable gown. Seymour, are you nervous? I said, Miss Smith, I can't even tell you. She said, well, if you think you're nervous now, Wait until you become famous. <laughs> then you'll know what real nervousness really is. So she was scared out of her wits. She had a TV program every day from four to five. 
and one evening every week. All right. So I would play it on her program. And a couple of weeks later, we received a letter. I was in special services after my basic training. We received a letter from someone who was making a program to honor Kate Smith for cementing relations between Christians and Jews. Ah. And please, could, could Fort Dick send a barbershop quartet to <laughs> sing on the program? I went to the lieutenant and I said, sir, we don't have a barbershop <laughs> quartet. He said, oh, yes, we do, Bernstein. I said, oh, no, sir, no, we no, don't make me sing in public. <laughs> Bernstein, get three other guys with you and make a barbershop quartet. The place was overloaded, which it was so famous, you know. The people were hanging from the rafter. There were so many people. <laughs> she enters the uh, temple and she walks and she stopped. Seymour, what are you doing here? Are you going to play on my program? I said, no, Miss Smith, I'm going to sing. She went, ah! <laughs> she slapped her thighs. She thought that was so funny. So we did our barbershop quartet, and we sat down in the temple to hear the rest of the program. Now the MC goes to Kate Smith and said, Miss Smith, we know you have a program every day. If you would like to leave now, we can go on without you. So she goes to the microphone. She said, before I leave, I want to tell you that one of the members of the Barbershop Quartet appeared on my program. Uh. And we never received so many requests for a repeat performance. Seymour... If it wouldn't be an imposition, would you play that piece that you played on the, I played the A-flat Polonaise. Right. I had practiced since then. I was in the army. I froze in my chair. My buddies picked me up under my arms and they dragged me to the piano. I don't know how I played the A-flat Polonaise. I can't even tell you. And because I did that, she had me on her evening show eight times when I was a civilian. And she came to my New York debut. A limousine pulled up in front of Town Hall with KS on the license plate. Nobody paid any attention to me. They all were looking up at the box at Kate Smith. <laughs> so she was my fan. That was the, one of the great experiences of my life. It was like in the movies, you know? Well, I have to ask you about another uh, imposing figure, uh, Leonard Bernstein, who you auditioned for. A Whoa! Few times. <laughs> oh. That was, I have nothing but unpleasant feelings about him. Well, you know, you, you write that you did play very well, but for several reasons it didn't work out that you would perform with him, but maybe that was sort of for the best. Would, would you like to say anything else about that? He wanted to engage me. He only liked three, three people at the audition. First, I auditioned for him privately right. in his apartment. And then I was told he wants to hear me on the stage of Carnegie Hall. And there I really played marvelously. And then I was told he only liked three people. And my manager let, let it slip right through her hands. And, and I concluded it's all for the best. I wasn't ready at that time. Mm. I would never felt ready, really. My ideals were so high all the time. Because we are uh, in Chicago here, I thought I'd just ask you if you have any memories to share about your debut with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. 
Oh, that was the most one of the most thrilling experiences of my life. This was 1969, I believe. Suffice it to say that when I walked across the stage of Orchestra Hall, my hair stood straight up on it. <laughs> I was so thrilled out of my mind. I played the first performance of Villalobos' third concerto. It was written for Brailovsky. Mm. He never played it, so he gave me the manuscript. I have had a very fascinating life, I have to tell you. There's another thing I wanted to ask you about, which is your State Department tours. I know there's a time when you were playing during a monsoon that was particularly memorable to me. Whoa. <laughs> well, there were over 30 people killed while I was playing. Oh, my, my gosh. Yeah. So, see, the auditorium was the safest building in Nagata, Nagata, Japan. Yes. So lots of people came to the audience, to the concert, to protect themselves. And the, so therefore the concert went on, but I was playing pictures at an exhibition. And of course, all the electricity went out. You try to play pictures at an exhibition in the <laughs> darkness. Somebody brought out a, a lantern and put it on the side of the piano. Just give me a little light. Well, the howling of that monsoon was so frightening. But the more harrowing story was after I was in the Korean War, I was in Korea on a State Department tour, and a revolution broke out. Yeah. Speaking about 30 people killed, you know, the students were mowed down by their own policemen. And so I was in that revolution and all my concerts were canceled. So the United States Embassy was right across the street from my hotel. And guess what the ambassador did? He was a professional clarinetist. And before the revolution had started, and I went across the street to the embassy through the, fi the firing weapons right down the block. And I went to the ambassador, I said, I want to play for the wounded students in the, in the, in the, in the hospital. Mm. He said, Seymour, what an amazing thing to do. Just a moment, he got on the phone, and in two seconds, there were about 10 reporters in the room from all over the world. You know, this was the major stuff was going on. They were, they demanded the resignation of President Reeve. So one night, my parents were watching the news, and suddenly, they saw their son sitting at a spinet piano in the ward with dying students. He's playing Troy Mirai of Schumann. Oh my God. They couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it. Went around the world. That story went around the world. American pianist plays for students, wounded students. So that, that was a, a, an experience that it overrode anything else, I think. Mm. That experience did, the revolution did. So I, how ironic, right? I'm a soldier at one, at one moment. Four years later, I'm a civilian and I'm in the war again. I thought I would ask you actually about your composing more because I found such um, exuberance in your compositions and you have this concerto for our time that was written for 
high school students to, you said you had this kind of idea of incorporating Minuet in G or something, and then you forgot about that and then realized later you had transposed the opening of Minuet in G and used that as the line backwards or upside yes, down yes, or something. Yes, yes, yes. And then there's other pastiches in that, like including Santa Claus is coming to town. It's very... Yes, yes, yes. yes. Very American composing to do all this. And in your other, um, your new pictures at an um, exhibition and American pictures at an exhibition... You also weave in these quotes of different music. Is that nobody knows those pieces, by the way? I know. There's, you know, you have these videos on YouTube with half a million views, and these have a couple hundred. But I really think people are missing out. Um, and I wonder if you could just tell us about your identity as a composer. I haven't composed anything for years now. Mm. I think I got it out of my system. Oh, wow. And I sort of got also a little depressed at the lack of interest in it. Putting it all together, I sort of stopped composing. I'm not, I don't feel guilty about it sure. because I got it out of my system. I really wanted to do it. And that's one of the reasons. See, you're the only one who pinpointed why I really abandoned my solo career. It was not just because of nervousness. It was because I had this passion to compose and write. You said it. You're the one who said it. And most people don't really go that route. Even Michael Kimmelman, who interviewed me, right? He said, "So he he went on this nervousness. Is that because you couldn't stand the nerves anymore? Is that why you would you quit?" No, Michael. It, it was the nerves. I I I I didn't make it very clear even then. I should have made it the real reason I did this was because I needed time to express myself. You're the one who said it properly. That means a lot to me, Seymour, and I'm very glad to see that because I found that very moving, and I, I almost think it's a thread I find in all of your work, from composing to writing books um, to performing, is that you are going to do things your own way. And people have many reactions to people who do things their own way, <laughs> and they don't oh, they always just... understand them. <laughs> but I love how you began the interview with that. You know, this was a major, major thing in my whole life, that right. decision, right? And you made it, you began the interview with on that subject. So you, you really understood how important that was. Because that, that determined the rest of my life. Look here. I felt if I didn't do that, I would have been dead long ago. And I'm, I'm not finding the quote exactly, but I remember you saying something in one of the books about approaching a new piece of music. And it is often something that's so complex that's going to require so many hours of study and practicing that you have to approach that with the same sort of humility. I think that's what it was. You called yourself like an, an explorer. Sure, sure, exactly, yes. There's one conclusion that came to me only in my 90s. The secret of, of, of keeping youthful and wanting always to reproduce something, to, to, to stay alive, right? Mm -hmm. I call that staying alive. The secret is 
to accept the challenge and never leave it until it's done. Mm. That's why I kept recording. Ah. I started to record at 90. I said, oh my God, it's, this is much better than my other recordings. I'll I'll repose now. No, no way. Now I'm ready to make some other recordings. I I just can't thank you enough for for those recordings, for that example, for everything you've said. This is um, a remarkable conversation that I'll remember forever. It is was for me too because of you. I'm I'm very honored. Thank you. You can check out and watch Seymour, an introduction through the library streaming service Canopy, or find the DVD here on the Deerfield Public Library shelves in our podcast collection. Find links to Seymour Bernstein's website and YouTube channel in our show notes and blog post. That's our show. Thank you to Seymour Bernstein for taking the time to talk with us. And thank you for listening to our 57th interview episode. Each month or so, we release an interview with a notable author or artist from our own Chicagoland or around the world. Comments and feedback are always welcome and can be sent to podcast at deerfieldlibrary.org. Go to deerfieldlibrary.org slash podcast to learn more about our show and find links to subscribe. You can also follow the library on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or check out our YouTube channel. Links are on our website or in our show notes. And special thanks to Daniel Baer for his help on this and everything else. We'll be back next month. Thanks for listening.